This episode is from series two of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description. Welcome to Close Readings, a series of LRB podcasts about modern writers who wrote poetry in English, British, Irish, American, drawing on the rich archive of essays and reviews and poems and other pieces published in the LRB over the years. My name is Seamus Perry, and I teach English at the University of Oxford. And I'm talking today, as usual, to my friend Mark Ford, poet, critic, and professor of English at University College London. And today, our subject is the poet Charlotte Mew. Perhaps not quite so, such a big name as some of the people we've talked about in this series, Mark, and a poet with a fairly slim production. Yes, her reputation has fluctuated a bit over the... Um, she died in uh, 1929, so almost 90, over 90 years since she died. Uh, she has had admirers in her lifetime. She had, Thomas Hardy calls her the best poetess. Uh, Walter de la Mare was a great admirer. Virginia Woolf liked her work, uh, Siegfried Sassoon. But she was also always a, a bit of a sort of a caviar to the general, and she wasn't particularly well known, and she had a kind of aversion to self-publicity. But in recent years, she has come quite a bit into fashion. There was a very detailed and enthralling biography published just last year by Julia Copus. And in 1984, I think, Penelope Fitzgerald wrote a really interesting book as well, which uh, explored not only Charlotte Mew, but her relationships with the, with her, her family and her friends. So there have been quite illustrious admirers over the years, but I wouldn't say that she's a household name. Well, you mentioned Penelope Fitzgerald there. Her, her biography is is uh, wonderful, and as people said at the time, almost sort of novelistic piece of writing, which evokes Mew's personality with great vividness and, and sympathy, I think. And Fitzgerald also contributed some pieces to the LRB about Mew, in one of which she reflected upon the role of the, of the biographer of uh, Charlotte Mew. And she said a very striking thing. This is in London Review of Books in 1982. She said, the biographer has not so much to reconstruct her life as to account for what life did to her. And I suppose the implication of that is that this was a life of considerable damage. This is a really hard life we're talking about today. Yes, I mean, not, not, kind of, not, a, not a life of poverty, but a life of loss. Uh, and her poetry features is, is powerful because of the ways in which she depicts maimed characters, characters who are damaged desolate, abandoned, marginalised. And yes, her family was one in which she she was one of six children. Uh, two died in infancy, two went mad. And uh, she and her sister Anne never married. There was madness in the family. And in that period, one of the reasons that she gave for not wanting to continue the Mew line was not wanting to potentially continue the line of insanity. That was was quite a sort of strong theory at the time. So I think there is a, while in some ways it's quite difficult to make links between her life and her poetry, her poetry is full of all sorts of interesting characters who don't seem to connect with Mew's own experiences. She often uses a male voice. A lot of her poems are set in France, so she didn't go to France that often, or set in the West Country where she only went a few times. So she was a very imaginative poet in terms of making use of persona and particularly of the dramatic monologue as she inherited it from the Victorians. Uh, but if you do know quite a bit about her life, Life. You can see the ways in which these maimed characters uh, refract her own sense of loss and the, the terrible, terrible experience it must have been of having two of her siblings spend nearly all their life, or, yeah, all their lives from their teenage years on in asylums. Yes, which in the case of her sister Frida was 60 years of, in, of incarceration, which, you know, among all the other awfulnesses of that, um, involved um, Charlotte Mew having to find money to, to pay for it for all those years. And financial hardship or financial difficulty is one of the recurrent themes, isn't it, in her... You're absolutely right, she wasn't exactly poor, but at the same time, her genteel life was uh, pretty 
underfunded. Yes, I mean, uh, she was born in um, Doughty Street, 30 Doughty Street. Actually, I went to visit it this morning and saw the blue plaque, which has recently been unveiled there. So that that's an indicator that, that uh, some people are... There are new fans who are capable of, of mobilising and getting a blue plaque on the house where she was born and where she lived until she was 21, same street where Dickens lived. And she was a huge, I should say, she was a huge Dickens fan and, uh, and read enormously in Victorian fiction. And the sources of her poetry are very much in the Victorian era. Christina Rossetti, Thomas Hardy, that he didn't begin publishing until 1898, Robert Browning, uh, Tennyson, these, uh, Emily Bronte, uh, these were the poets in particular whose work she reconfigured to create her own sort of distinctive oeuvre. So you can see that it's got one foot in the Victorian camp, but there are other ways in which it, it does seem strikingly modern. And it does, uh, I mean, Ezra, Ezra Pound took one of her poems, Fate for the Egoist. So there's a way in which she's not a million miles from some of the experiments going on in the kind of modernist era in the first um, 20 years of the 20th century, but she she is also making use of the template of the, the Victorian dramatic monologue. So this terrible exposure, which I suppose in some ways wasn't untypical for a Victorian family, to infant death, uh, to a, to a childhood which she always thought of as being a happy childhood, but was nevertheless f- full of the death of siblings or the illness of siblings. This clearly works into her poetry, which is often dominated, isn't it, by the idea of death and the idea of things missing. She writes a lovely poem, I don't know, 10 or 12 years after the death of her five-year-old brother to whom she was very close, a poem called To a Child in Death, in which she says, what shall we do with this strange summer meant for you? Dear, if we see the winter through, what shall be done with spring? And that whole sense of um, lives that are incomplete or lives that have some element missing from them or lives that are haunted by a sense of mortality and, and, and deathliness. That's very, very strong in her work, isn't it? More even so than most Victorian poets. Yes. The elegiac element is, is really very powerful. And there's a sense of nostalgia for lost experience, as well as uh, as famous poems like To a Child in Death or In, in Nunhead Cemetery, which are explicitly about people who have died. And she's less whimsical, I suppose, than some Victorians could be. Her religious beliefs are difficult to pin down, but she wasn't a believer as far as one can tell. And uh, at the end of her life, didn't she receive a note from somebody who said, you can take faith in the Lord? And she said, actually, I take faith in friends rather than the Lord. That Friends were what stayed her rather than belief in some afterlife. So she was part of that generation which didn't have an unthinking belief in the transcendental or Christianity. And her father was a not particularly distinguished architect by all accounts. And her mother was felt that she was a bit posher than her father and and, uh, both Fitzgerald and Julia Copas in her new biography have rather unkind things to say about Charlotte Mew's mother who wanted to live in in a quite sort of genteel style without without sort of that being affordable for them Uh, but they she did grow up in this not very nice street Doughty Street and then she moved to Gordon Street just next to Gordon Square but after her father died, it fell to her to make ends meet. And horror of horrors, they had to take in lodgers, <laughs> which meant that, that Charlotte and Anne and her mother Maria didn't invite people round because it was such a disgrace. So there's a bit of a contradiction that on the one hand, she seems to have been keen to keep up appearances. And on the other, one gets glimpses of her as a rather bohemian figure uh, about London, dressing in an unconventional way, a way which made many assume afterwards, after the event, that she was a lesbian. She was wearing quite mannish clothes. And there is still some debate, uh, though Julia Copas tries to squash it, uh, that she, she may have been attracted to women rather than to men. The new biography records the fact there is no evidence whatsoever for her having romances with, with either men or with women, whereas Penelope Fitzgerald rather entertainingly riffs on the notion that uh, Charlotte Mew was attracted to women and had crushes on people like Ella Darcy and Mason Clare. 
Yes, and there's a good, there's a good letter, isn't there, that we might mention at this point. Uh, Matthew Bevis reviewed uh, the, the the most recent biography that that you've been discussing um, very positively in the LRB last year, or earlier this year in 2022, and a letter from uh, the author arrived saying that it's true that, that Fitzgerald's biography maybe has a certain amount of novelistic colour, which was what Matthew Bevis was noting, perhaps the relative absence of in the in the in the new biography, but that that uh, novel novelistic colour was based upon kind of invention <laughs> rather than archival research. Nevertheless, I think that Fitzgerald has absolutely her finger on something key, which you've just uh, drawn our attention to there, Mark, which is this great kind of animating paradox in Charlotte Mew. On the one hand, as you say, Emily Bronte is her favourite writer, and I suppose in some senses her role model. So there's a certain kind of kind of asocial or desocialized kind of imaginative wildness that's associated with the figure of Emily Bronte. And it's not just Wuthering Heights that she admires, it's particularly the poems, which is a fairly unusual taste to have in the 1870s. So there's that whole kind of wildness that she's um, interested in and, and keen on, but at, uh, the enfant terrible and so on. But at the same time, she's inherited from her mum a strong sense of the importance of social nicety. And she is never really rebellious, is she? She doesn't really take part in any of the great political upheavals of her age about female emancipation or the widening of the franchise more generally or anything like that. And Fitzgerald gathers that all together in rather a nice sentence, I think, in her biography, where she says, there is pathos in this clinging to gentility by a free spirit who seemed born to have nothing to do with it. Do you, do you see that similar kind of tension there? Yes, and I think that very often the, the narratives that her poems develop are about people who are mismatched uh, in some way, that there's a disjunction between people. And her poetry was clearly a way of trying to bridge the imaginative impulses which push her to explore life in quite a wide range of ways with a, a, a life that when you read it day to day seems to have been very confined that she was looking after her invalid mother her sister was worked as a in design and they were looking to make ends meet and Charlotte Mew wrote stories first of it was published in the yellow book which I guess was quite sort of radical at that time or at least had kind of revolutionary or iconoclastic implications but I think, I mean, her, she only published in her life, and this is one of the uh, st startling aspects, one book, uh, The Farmer's Bride, in uh, 1916, which was published when she would have been, how old was she then, you know, in her 40s. And it was published by the Poetry Bookshop, which was becoming a sort of centre for both kind of George, Georgian poets and modernist poets. Harold Munro published it. And The Farmer's Bride is a good example if you... It's a wonderful, wonderful poem, and we could maybe just talk about it a bit. I think it probably is her best-known poem and one of her most powerful poems. And you can see the influence on it of Thomas Hardy. But it, in essence, its story is about a farmer who is hasn't time to woo, and he marries a young thing, and she flees him. She can't bear sex or living with him or uh, sharing a bed with him. And she's a sort of naive and a waif and a damaged typically damaged person. And the poem explores... What's interesting is the way the poem explores the farmer's experience quite sympathetically as well as the farmer's bride's experience quite sympathetically. So it's not like she judges or uh, uh, privileges one over the other. Um, I tell you what, why don't you read it to us? I mean, it's a, it's a longish dramatic monologue, but it's an extraordinarily powerful poem, and I don't think it's possible to convey... It's power, really, if you only have a, a fragment of it. The Farmer's Bride Three summers since I chose a maid Too young, maybe, but more's to do At harvest time than bide and woo When us was wed, she turned afraid Of love and me and all things human Like the shut of a winter's day Her smile went out, and twasn't a woman More like a little frightened fay One night in the fall she runned away out among the sheep her bee, they said, should properly have been abed. But sure enough, she wasn't there, lying awake with her wide brown stare. So over seven acre field and up along across the down, we chased her, flying like a hare before our lanterns. The church town, all in a shiver and a scare, we caught her, fetched her home at last and turned the key upon her fast. 
She does the work about the house as well as most, but like a mouse. Happy enough to chat and play with birds and rabbits and such as they, so long as menfolk keep away. Not near, not near, her eyes beseech when one of us comes within reach. The women say that beasts in stall look round like children at her call. I've hardly heard her speak at all. Shy as a leveret, swift as he, straight and slight as a young larch tree, sweet as the first wild violets, she, to her wild self. But what to me? The short days shorten and the oaks are brown, the blue smoke rises to the low grey sky, one leaf in the still air falls slowly down, a magpie's spotted feathers lie on the black earth spread white with rime, the berries redden up to Christmas time. What's Christmas time without there be some other in the house than we? She sleeps up in the attic there, alone, poor maid. Tis but a stare betwixt us. Oh, my God, the down, the soft young down of her, the brown, the brown of her, her eyes, her hair, her hair. There's a wonderful question in one of... Penelope Fitzgerald's letters, where she says about Mew, she did write at least one good poem. How many of us can say that? And I, this is the poem that she means. Mm. It is a remarkable poem, isn't it? And so much of it is about the way that the voice of the farmer is inhabited, that it's the voice of a man who is at once extraordinarily unsympathetic um, in some ways, completely out of his depth emotionally, psychologically. He doesn't know what he's dealing with at all. And yet at the same time kind of wins our sympathy in, in a kind of unexpected and, and very difficult to rationalise sort of way. Well, that line, the last of the, at the end of the second stanza, we caught her, fetched her home at last and turned the key upon her fast mm. is a really chilling one. And at the end, he's obviously tormented by some kind of erotic desire for her. And yet they live separately in this house. And you can see the influence of something like The Fire at Trantoswetli's, a, a Hardy poem written in the 1870s about sort of, it's a, it's a standard rural, rural narrative, isn't it? Um, the mismatched farmer marrying a, a young maid who doesn't want to be married to this farmer. But I think it's the rhyme schemes which are perhaps most, her originality derives from the ways in which her rhymes work in a slightly haphazard way, but they really clinch the poem and she's not afraid to use uh, triple rhymes, day, fay, away, and he, tree, she, me. And it's those rhymes which trip from line to line which create the pathos of the poem. And reading, I read, re, you can read all of Charlotte Mew's poetry in a couple of hours, by the way. So um, don't, don't be daunted in thinking we're talking about a Browning-like oeuvre. We're talking about some sort of 70 poems. And they are very moving, mainly, or it's through the rhymes, I think, that their pathos expresses itself or one experiences it, as well as the stories that they tell. And her, her stock in trade, as it were, is either people who are insane, and she writes about people who are in, in asylums and are otherwise, as it were, medically mentally ill in one way or another as it as it was conceived within her own period or people who suffer from immense kind of mental emotional turbulence like the speaker of of this poem and it's interesting too isn't it to think about the way in which the the bride is compared throughout this poem to animal life that she flies like the hare she's shy as a leveret she is quiet as a mouse about the house uh, she's at ease with the farm animals and the rabbits, and they're at ease with her, but it's human approach that terrifies her. And this is clearly a way of you thinking about her own relationship with a wider male society, I, I suppose. I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, the earlier poem that you referred to called The Changeling, where she imagines herself addressing her parents, but conscious that actually she isn't their biological child. I suppose it's a fantasy that lots and lots of children have, but this is a very vivid and interesting reworking of that of that common fantasy. I so wild your disgrace with the queer brown face was never, never I know, but half your child. And these are all very brilliantly imagined kind of myths of, of, of not quite belonging to human society in, in the way that 
you know, perhaps people might expect her to. And they're typical of the Edwardian era. Peter Pan obviously comes to mind by J.M. Barry, and the ways in which kind of religious belief was being transmuted into kinds of folk um, interest in fays or fairies like the changeling or Peter Pan was indicative of the extent to which religion was kind of crumbling around the edges and yet the spiritual impulse was, was rechanneling itself in all kinds of different ways. So closeness to animals in The Farmer's Bride or the, the changeling's connection with the landscape and her the extent to which she doesn't belong in the bourgeois family. So, as we were saying, Mew has a foot in both camps in some ways, um, that some of her poems do explore um, bourgeoisness, but there's often you get the family falling apart in quite a sort of interesting way, so that characters who have somehow lose touch with the family and the families break apart... um, Uh, The Quiet House. Mm. When we were children, old nurse used to say the house was like an auction or a fair until the lot of us were safe in bed. It has been quiet as the countryside since Ted and Janie and then mother died and Tom crossed father and was sent away. After the lawsuit, he could not hold up his head. Poor father, and he does not care for people here or to go anywhere. You've got a complete breakdown in that sentence of an entire Victorian family, the mother, the t- two children dying, Tom somehow upsetting his father. is a lawsuit, father's broken down. It's the sort of disintegration of Victorian stabilities, which I think Mew's poetry serves as a kind of, um, is a solvent of all those certainties uh, and takes us into wild and strange places with, without ever becoming wholly mystical or wholly kind of committed to some other way of being. Yes, and you mentioned that she uh, first published a story. Her first um, publication was a story in The Yellow Book, which is the, the controversial volume published by um, Lane that became associated with scandalous figures like Oscar Wilde and Aubrey Beardsley and people like that. So absolutely putting her on the <clears throat> avant-garde edge of things. But also when she appeared in the second volume of The Yellow Book, which is 1894, she's alongside Henry James. So it, she's a kind of, I mean, she's never very famous, as you've been saying, but she sort of arrives in a, in, in a fairly kind of tentative way. And in the company of Henry James, which I think is interesting, because so many of the poems, like the one you've just referred to, sort of a, imply a novelistic kind of background or a, or a whole novel that might have been written rather than the poem, which is what we've what we've got, and I'm, I'm thinking about a poem like that, like the one that you, you, you just quoted, or a poem like in the Nunhead Cemetery, which is the monologue of a man watching his fiance being buried, thinking about their romantic encounters in London. Very London poet, isn't she, in some ways, um, as, as the location for these novelistic scenarios. And as you read on through this poem, which is only, I suppose, a hundred or so lines long, you realise that the man who is narrating this story, the man who's telling this, who, who, who we're listening to, is slowly going crazy, going crazy with, with grief as he watches um, the funeral and watches his hopes for a, a, you know, a satisfying life evaporate. And if you think about that, that way of being you know, trapped inside um, a speaking voice, the sanity of which you become increasingly to suspect... That is the world of James, isn't it? That is the, that is the, the whole quality of a, of a James tale like Turn of the Screw. Turn of the Screw, I was going to say, yes, ab- absolutely. And it has a particular resonance in that her older brother, Henry, was buried in Nunhead Cemetery. So it is a, a reconfiguration of what was a terribly sad occasion for Mew when her brother, who had spent all this time in asylums, in first in Camden uh, and then in Peckham, and then dies at the age of uh, 36, who was diagnosed with schizophrenia, I think it was, or dementia prycox. And yet the way that Mew refigures it is really astonishing. It's a, uh, someone who describes himself as a cheap, stale chap. He's like a sort of tragic pooter. Yes, I mean, it, it, and I think this is interestingly of the period. It's like John Davidson, 30 bob a week, would come up with a similar kind of, of notion of the lower middle class 
hero become, coming into poetry, perhaps in in a, in a way that was new. This cheap, stale chap whose experience of the of the woman he's in love with, who has then been just been buried in Nunhead, has transfigured him and changed him, and yet he is and he is left with nothing uh, and goes. Mad, semi-mad, kind of, you know, it gets kind of ecstatic or strange. Mm. And the rhetoric gets increasingly kind of difficult to follow. And uh, that that is the kind of the, the pathos of the Mew character, mm. is someone who means well, uh, is decent, but somehow slides off the rails and is either institutionalised, as is the case in things like Asylum Road or Ken. Ken is another incredibly painful poem, isn't it, about someone who is sent to an asylum and um, you see his eyes at the end, the uh, the eyes, his eyes, these I shall... S- so this is the last stanza. So when they took Ken to that place, I did not look after he called and turned on me, his eyes, these I shall see. Really devastating. Yes, yes. And, and um, alluding back, isn't it, to earlier in that poem where... Uh, the speaker says, and I said then, if in his image God made men, some other must have made poor Ken, but for his eyes, which looked at you as two red wounded stars might do, which is an extraordinary line, isn't it? What What is a wounded star? <laughs> um, but it's extremely painful and, and at the same time, you know, imaginatively extraordinarily imp- impressive, isn't it, as a, uh, as a way of imagining you know, that extraordinarily kind of alienating alterity that is encountering, you know, mental trouble. And also you are experiencing it from Mew's perspective and you get a sense of what it was like for Mew to have two siblings in asylums, incurably insane. Frida jumped out of a window, didn't she, in the Isle of Wight and stayed there till 1959. And the threat of that, I think, is perhaps present in the poetry as well. Mew was eccentric in the way she behaved. I think both biographies by Fitzgerald and Copus give us a sense of her distinctiveness. And uh, although she was proud of her poetry, when someone like Lady Ottoline Morell tried to take her up, she was absolutely resolute in refusal and she didn't participate. Uh, And she lived round the corner from Virginia Woolf, whom she never met. She really didn't seek that much to become a literary type or a literary person content to publish her poems and and have them. And then she did go down to Max Gate in uh, December of 1918. Hardy's Florence uh, was it uh, was it Florence read um, Mew to Hardy and and he thought this is terrific. Hardy didn't fall in love with her as he did with 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 some kind of literary young women. Florence <clears throat> and uh, Charlotte Mew had a, quite a long correspondence and. Uh, Florence would often read Charlotte Mew's poetry out loud to Hardy in the evenings, and he was a great admirer of it. And one of the sort of touching details of her life was after, right towards the end, there's a poem of hers called Fan de Fate. And after Hardy died, Sidney Cockrell found a copy of this written out in Hardy's hand, <laughs> and he gave this to Charlotte Mew. Uh, and she was very, very pleased to think that, that Hardy had thought well enough of her poem to write it out and keep it on his desk. Yeah, Sidney Cockrell, we should probably explain, was the director of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge at the time and a great f- friend and, and sort of, in some ways, like career manager for Hardy, wasn't he, towards the end of towards the end of Hardy's life, but also was one of those men who had a finger in every single pie and knew about the poetry bookshop and Harold Munro, this rather eccentric evangelical lover of poetry who you referred to earlier on, who is the person who publishes um, Mew's one and only book, despite Mew's uh, recalcitrance, really, in seeing it through to press. And uh, Cockrell is then, as you say, the guy who discovers this manuscript and and I suppose recognises the the importance of it. What, what do you think it was that Hardy saw in in Charlotte Mew? Well, she was using provincial material in the way that he did, and she used dialect as well, as we mentioned in a, a poem such as The Farmer's Bride, but also in things like... Uh, there's a couple of other poems which uh, also use dialect in an effective way. So she was not, af- not af- afraid to explore different ways, colloquial language, but all her poetry rhymes, or most of it rhymes, which Hardy liked. And a po- the poem that he, he wrote out is one in which, I could read it, it's quite short. Yes, but let's it, have that. It, it's um, 
obviously connects with his own poems about his uh, about Emma, his dead wife, and um, he had a kind of mythology of of the the widower surviving the dead wife, and this played into that. So this is why he liked it. Fan de fête, sweetheart, for such a day one mustn't grudge the score. Here then, it's all to pay. It's good night at the door. Good night and good dreams to you. Do you remember the picture book thieves who left two children sleeping in a wood the long night through and how the birds came down and covered them with leaves? So you and I should have slept, but now, oh, what a lonely head with just the shadow of a waving bough in the moonlight over your bed. So we're in the graveyard at the end of that with the tree over the beloved's grave. The lonely head is pure Mew, isn't it? Yes. All heads are lonely in Mew, I think. There was yes. obviously something which was, I mean, I'm sure our listeners can immediately recognise from hearing you read that, that, that this is coming out of a kind of, I don't know, a late romantic or a 19th century tradition. But at the same time, that I think people at the time picked up something that was more modern or, or something a little bit more disconcerting about it, don't you? I, 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 I'm struck, for example, that one of the things that Munro does is publish the Georgian poetry anthologies, which, um, you know, become the voice of the last gasp of pre-modernist English poetry, as it were, before T.S. Eliot comes on the scene and, and rips up all that. But in their own in their own way, they were, you know, sort of cutting edge. People like Walter Delamere, young poets, D.H. Lawrence, Rupert Brooke, all that sort of thing. And the Farmer's Bride is considered for one of the Georgian poetry anthologies, but but it's turned down. And Walter Delamere, who's a very sympathetic and and you know broad-minded reader doesn't like it. He thinks there's something too kind of unstable about it. There's something about the meter that's too bewildering. It doesn't seem to follow any of the kinds of lyrical, metrical, musical rules that that D Delamere thinks that lyric poetry should follow. And I suppose Georgian poetry as a whole thought should follow. Yes, Delamere came round to her work. He, he initially dismissed it, but then he did come round to it and um, did uh, praise it and prom promote her. But I think in terms of getting a sense of how she uh, was quite challenging to initial readership, it's worth noting that her longest poem, Madeline in Church, when it was set up, but the printer started setting it up and then refused to because it was blasphemous and uh, they, the poetry bookshop had to find another printer. And the, bl the blasphemy may seem quite tame to us. It's about a, a, a woman who has been divorced several times and has had many lovers in church and she is dividing her attention. Initially, she she's devoting her attention to a, 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 an out-of-the-way saint, a yes, plaster, plaster saint, saint, rather than to Jesus, whom she finds a little too overwhelming. But then she does address him. But she addresses him from the point of view of, of uh, Magdalene, uh, uh, Mary Magdalene. And it's quite an erotic passage in which Mary Magdalene is imagined <laughs> uh, or described as her wet cheek lying there and her perfume clinging to you from head to feet all through the day. So it's actually quite a sort of sensual vision. I suppose that's not unknown in, in church iconography, but um, it obviously struck the person who was, who was setting this up in type as uh, beyond the bounds of decency. Yes. It's also good as head to feet rather than head to foot because it does make you think about his feet. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, a very bodily poem, isn't it? And I think it's it's yes. a fascinating kind of exploration of the of the odd kind of slightly kinky relationship between certain sorts of Christianity and certain sorts of intense sensuousness, or indeed sensuality. I, you could see why the printer might have been <laughs> a bit taken aback by it. Also, I mean, the, the strange registers in this poem that we learn the names of some of her husbands. Monty is one of them. Yeah, that's and great, isn't it? Reg is another. So Monty and Reg... Uh, um, are, are interleaved with these um, discussions of Calvary and Christ and, and her memories of her kind of erotic nights. Yeah. I love it when she says, Monty, uh, suddenly gone blank and old, the hateful day of the divorce. Stuart got his, hands down, of course, crowing like 20 cocks and grinning like a horse, but Monty took it hard. <laughs> now, there's no voice like that, is there, really? And in what I suppose is, is in some senses, late Victorian, even though it's early 20th century uh, verse. 
getting Monty into English verse, that's a great achievement, I think. But also things like Hands Down, of course, that kind of whole kind of colloquial register that, that uh, lots of 20th century poets will... Will will get into the into the textures of their of their poems. I mean, she's she's doing it very early, isn't she? I, I think the pathos does come from the instability that of the poems that they they move in ways that we don't expect them to, and they are mini narratives, as you were saying, with with your connection to Henry James, that they are character sketches or portraits of 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 characters whose lives we are inducted into in a way which is unfamiliar they don't have the the grand browning-esque framing in which instructs us how to interpret them that they exist in something of a moral vacuum mm. and we can't particularly interpret or work out why she was drawn to these particular characters or is exploring them except they seem to unleash her poetic imagination and that poetic imagination as i've been saying in terms of the rhyming the rhyming does seem to be the thing that that drives them like a, a, a metronome or like is the energy in them and her rhyming seems to carry the poems and uh, the characters become very vivid as well as eccentric and as a as a dramatic monologist if that's the right word that that is a difference isn't it from the browning tradition that she's working out of because this extremely, as, as you've been describing it, this extremely sort of non-judgmental way in which she, almost as it were, psychological way, purely psychological way in which she treats her, her speakers, her characters, that is a change from someone like Browning, who, I mean, however complicated his moral judgments might be, you are at no doubt in the Browning poem that moral judgment is one of the important things that's at work. And in, in you, as, as, as you've just been saying, that's, that's not quite where the focal interest is, is it? And the psychology is sort of eccentric and, and startling and strange. At the end of Madeline in Church, she goes back to her childhood, as Mew quite often does, and she recalls how she felt about Christ when she was a child. And it's unnerving literalness, I suppose, which is what makes it seem such a, a sort of p painful and psychologically probing. Um, it's worth mentioning Mae Sinclair, with whom she was good friends for a while with, was one of the earliest expounders of Freud. There's no evidence that May herself was particularly interested in Freud. But I'll just leap, read the last bit of Madeline in Church, which is her reflecting on how she experienced Christ as a child, as a sort of evidence of the kind of quirkiness of the Mew experience. I cannot bear to look at this divinely bent and gracious head. When I was small, I never quite believed that he was dead. And at the convent school, I used to lie awake in bed, thinking about his hands. It did not matter what they said. He was alive to me, so hurt, so hurt. And most of all, in Holy Week, when there was no one else to see, I used to think it would not hurt me too so terribly if he had ever seemed to notice me or if, for once, he would only speak. Yes, and, and that is such a characteristic piece of me writing, isn't it? Because it is about an experience that gets into the poem only under the, uh, the remit of an if. Uh, she's a great poet of the conditional, isn't she? Things that might have happened but didn't happen or things that could have happened, um, like a marriage that never happened or a death that never happened or whatever else it might be. She's, I'm surprised that Philip Larkin didn't like her more or perhaps, perhaps he does, he's on, he's on record saying that he, like, he likes her because it seems to me that she's occupying in some ways quite a similar kind of emotional territory of, of, of what it is to lead a life that's haunted by the life that's not been led. Yes. Well, he included five pages of her poetry in the uh, 1973 so he did. You're quite Oxford right. Book of English Poetry. And he, she did connect, I think, with a sense of quiet lives lived in desperation, <laughs> which don't rupture entirely the fabric of things. They're not kind of revolutionary in any grand way, but capture the pathos of surviving in straightened circumstances on... And I think he, he would have liked her for exactly the reasons that he liked Christina Rossetti, that there's a kind of stoicism which survives in the poems, even when they're de describing kind of craziness or dysfunction or instability. Now, we should say, just to um, fill the story out, 1916, as you say, May 1916 is when the Poetry Bookshop, run by Munro, publishes The Farmer's Bride, a tiny little pamphlet, 
extraordinarily rare. If you ever see it in the Oxfam bookshop, you must buy it. It's only got 17 poems in it, and it's a very odd shape because she insisted that the page was white enough to contain her long lines without a wrap over. So she was a bit of a pain to publish. And that's what draws her to the attention of Hardy. Uh, five years later, a second edition of The Farmer's Bride comes out. So it's not a great seller, uh, as she herself was the first to anticipate. But 1921, as a slightly expanded edition comes out, and it's published in the United States for the first time. And it attracts attention on both sides of the Atlantic. And as, as you've mentioned earlier on, Wolf and Sassoon and lots of other people like it. Marion Moore admires it. And one of the poems that's in that second edition of The Farmer's Bride is a really striking poem called Saturday Market, which was one of the poems that Charlotte Mew read to Hardy when she was his house guest at Max Gate for a couple of days. And I, I, I thought we might look at this just briefly because Penelope Fitzgerald says that it's one of the most successful things that Charlotte Mew ever wrote. And it was one of the, as I say, one of the things that particularly struck Hardy. And Saturday Market is a very harsh, very sort of socially brutal poem um, about a woman walking through a market subjected to the cruel laughter of the crowd. So it's a poem about how brutal small towns and villages can be, which is obviously something that Hardy also evokes in lots of his novels and, and, and poems. And the, and the mystery, the oddity of the poem is that is that this woman who's being derided as she walks through the market is concealing something under her dress or under her apron, and, it, and, it, and it's not quite clear what it is. It, it, could, it could be an aborted child, or perhaps it's her pregnancy that she's seeking to hide, and, and an act of infanticide that seems to be on the horizon as soon as she's through the market. It's a very striking poem, isn't it? Yes, um, and it is mysterious. See you, the shawl is wet. Take out from under the red dead thing. In the white of the moon, on the flags, does it stir again? Well, and no wonder. Best make an end of it. Bury it soon. If there is blood on the hearth, who will know it? Or blood on the stairs? When a murder is over and done, why show it? In Saturday market, nobody cares. It does have something of the Tess burying yeah. sorrow Absolutely. in Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Um, but, it, but Mew is, is not explicit about, but it certainly seems that she is some kind of fallen woman mm. who is being, um, who has some kind of inf infanticide has occurred. Very powerful, I think. You see why Hardy warmed to it. I think especially because of the way it ends with this. The whole poem is, is couched as an address to the woman in a, in a very you know, rhetorically striking way. And and when we get to the end, there's a wonderful kind of gear shift into pathos and sympathy. It ends, then lie you... So when all this episode, whatever it is, is over, and she's back home again, um, you write, then lie you straight on your bed for a short, short weeping, and still for a long, long rest. There's never a one in the town so sure of sleeping as you in the house, on the down, with a hole in your breast. And you think, well, is, is that, as it were, a psychological hole? Mm -hmm. You know, the gap in her heart where the child once was, or is this like a more Hausmann-esque suicide hole that she shot herself through the heart? And the poem exists brilliantly, doesn't it, in between these two realms of psychological insight and Victorian melodrama. I think it, I, I absolutely see why Hardy would warm to it. Yes, it is. Um, there was another poem, On the Road to the Sea, which the, the Hardys had a dispute about, and they couldn't work out whether it was a man speaking or a woman speaking, and they actually asked Charlotte Mew, and she finally confessed that it was, in her opinion, it was a middle-aged man yeah. who had seen the woman twice, <laughs> but in a Hardyish way was still thinking about her and in love with her all these years afterwards. So the, the kind of obliquities of Mew are, are quite interesting, that she is indeterminate. She leaves certain things unclear in a way that Hardy rarely does, in fact. And that, I guess, is, is another aspect of the ways that she can seem quite kind of modern, that one's not clear exactly what the source of the anxiety always is. Well, we must bring her sad story to a, to a close, I suppose. 1923... Her aged mother finally dies, and then they really do hit financial difficulties, Charlotte and her sister Anne. 
as you say, Delamere comes around and, and helps get her a civil pension, but they're never very well off. And then the most terrible event of her life really was the death of her sister Anne in 1927, after which her own mental collapse was pretty quick. Um, she has appalling fantasies of deadly black dust in the rooms that she and Anne had shared for so long. All this is brilliantly described in a piece, incidentally written by Penelope Fitzgerald, which appears in the LRB in 2002 and is anthologized in a LRB anthology of Fitzgerald's pieces that came out quite recently. On the 24th of March, um, she goes to the local chemist and buys a bottle of Lysol, which is a disinfectant, uh, I, I learn, based on creosote, which she drank and some appallingly agonizing hours later, uh, she dies. Um, and a lot of the pathos of this extraordinarily awful death, as Fitzgerald points out, is that she chose Lysol because it was the cheapest way of killing yourself. So she's, as it were, harried by, by financial troubles, even to the choice of her method of suicide. And she's only 59. One um, last volume comes out posthumously in 1929, a volume called The Rambling Sailor, also from the Poetry Bookshop, which gathers together whatever it was the Munros could find that hadn't been um, printed before. And that has some very striking and, and rather moving poems full of all the mew atmosphere that, that uh, I hope we've we've conveyed to, to listeners. Shall we end with one of those? Um, before, we, we should perhaps do a bit of justice to Alida Clementaski or um, Alida Munro. She, she, without her, mew possibly wouldn't have ever sort of appeared in, 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 in book form. Uh, that She loved Mew's work so much. And she was, also deserves pity for marrying Harold Munro, who was <laughs> cl- clearly gay uh, and tormented. Oh, and, and, uh, and, and, and tormented and an appalling alcoholic and all sorts of things, yes. <laughs> uh, I think Susanna Clapp, in a rather good piece, um, I don't know how, tr- how she would have known this, but she says that on the wedding night he calls her, he says to her, come here, boy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which can't have been very inspiriting for no. any of And one of the things lamented in in the in the the rambling solar book are the destruction of trees she was very upset about trees being um pulled down she she writes a couple of, of super i mean really good essays about men and trees <laughs> that she publishes in i think the nation all which is full of you know the myths and legends that are about about the relationship between human beings and trees and she's particularly moved by the pathos of london trees and i think the trees that that you might be about to read about are trees that were cut down in euston square gardens i think as part of the development of that of that part of london in this she resembles a poet people don't know much about even more obscure called amy levy have you come across amy levy um wrote a book called london plane tree i think um i included a couple in my anthology of london but she too was a great one for celebrating london's Plains or London's trees. Yes, I'll finish with this one called um, Domus Caedet Arborem, or The Home Kills the Tree. It's uh, only four lines long. Ever since the great plains were murdered at the end of the gardens, the city to me at night has the look of a spirit brooding crime, as if the dark houses watch the trees from dark windows were simply biding their time. This episode is from Series 2 of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.